What's going on guys, this is Rob, and welcome back to Comics Explained, where I make you a comic book expert in 30 minutes or less, and in this video, I'm gonna make you guys an expert on the Mandarin from Marvel Comics. Now, here's the funny thing. If you go and you look up the origin of the Mandarin, right now, you will find the most modern origin of the character, but while I don't normally do this, we're actually gonna go back and cover his original origin as well as his modern origin, because the original origin is kind of significant, largely because it gives you context to the character more so than the modern day origin does. But uh, the Mandarin first made his appearance in Marvel Comics with Tales of Suspense issue number 50 in 1964, and he was created by Stan Lee and Don Heck. Now, the biggest reason why this happened, as opposed to just Iron Man number one, because he's an Iron Man villain largely, uh, is because Tales of Suspense was originally an Iron Man comic, and then eventually Iron Man got his own comic later on down the line. But the origin of the Mandarin didn't immediately come to us, which was kind of a change of pace from what you normally saw with comics, especially during the 1960s. Normally, whenever you saw a villain introduced, or like a new hero who was introduced, like on the Avengers team or in an Avengers story and say, and by the way, here's how I got my powers. Instead with the Mandarin, it actually happened about five issues after he first showed up. And again, that kind of makes sense, right? Because with him appearing in Tales of Suspense, we didn't really know if there was going to be a whole lot of interest in his character. Now, the way the original origin unfolded for his character, it played out in such a way where it basically told us that at some point along the line, uh, the Mandarin was born to what was in effect a wealthy family, but his father ended up perishing. Now, a lot of this was based on the idea that it was was like a bad omen just because of the fact that when he was born literally a giant idol fell on his dad and killed him and so as a result of that his aunt essentially his father's sister was basically jealous of the mandarin in this idea that he was essentially inheriting all the wealth from his family as well as a family lineage because one of the things that was established in the early days here is that the mandarin is a direct descendant of genghis khan and so it was a way to kind of tie into the history of china specifically mongolia and then say there's a long-standing lineage there and so the result of this is that the aunt initially tried to not really kill the Mandarin, but basically wrap him up and then take him to a local village and leave him there where he would basically be raised without any knowledge of who he truly was. And she would in turn inherit all the wealth by just saying the baby's vanished. It's gone. Who knows? But like I'm the rightful heir now. Uh, ultimately, an idol fell next to her, which was taken as an omen that basically the gods had been looking out for them. Now, right off the bat, you can kind of tell here there's a reason why this origin was changed. One of the things that was really a big stereotype when it came to uh, Asia, as, at least as it was perceived in the United States, is that people from Asia, specifically from East Asia, right? So China, Japan, Vietnam, places like that, were like highly superstitious. And even in this comic, they refer to people of Asian descent as Orientals, which is a very antiquated, if not borderline racist term in this day and age. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why this origin was really changed. And also because it's just overly complex. But the result of this is that because this was, was taken as an omen that the child needs to live, in effect, every ounce of the family's money was basically spent teaching him everything he needed to know about the world's sciences and specifically how to become a villain. The result of this is that the family never paid their taxes. And so when time came due, the government basically seized their land and kicked them out. And so as a result of this, the Mandarin basically wandered the streets as a homeless man when his aunt had essentially died the next day. And even when he was working in the fields, he always maintained this air of having an exceedingly proud history and basically walked as if he was a nobleman, despite having no nobility whatsoever, right? No wealth, no land, none of that stuff. And so ultimately his travels bring him to a place called the Valley of Spirits, which he was initially warned not to travel to by a local villager, but took it as a sign that it was a, kind of a, a destiny for himself, right? That he needed to find out what was going on there and then ultimately came across what he saw as a glowing light. And so once he made his way to this Valley of the Spirits, he came across this giant, you know, dragon skeleton, kind of fell and then stumbled across a spaceship. And that's when you end up learning this kind of dragon is not really a dragon in the traditional sense. And it was one of the ways that Marvel tease the idea of dragons in the early days, simply just offering this explanation that dragons in the traditional sense as we know them uh, may or may not exist. Instead, it was basically this guy being what's called a McLuhan in the sense that he comes from a, a planet called Maklu 4 and had literally just gone into the end of the universe exploring to see if there was other life, other intelligent life outside their own. And while he had stumbled across different planets and worlds and so on, it was only when he arrived on Earth and met the primitive nature of humanity that humanity was fearful and then basically mortally wounded this guy, he took off to a cave and then ultimately died. And so during this time when the Mandarin's just kind of listening to this entire story while he's on this spaceship, he ends up discovering the ship's source of power, which comes in the form of 10 rings. And so by getting these 10 rings, he basically masters all these different abilities, or at least these rings, you know, present him with different abilities. And then he in turn goes forward and actually starts conquering the local village and then coming to this realization that because of the power he possesses and the fact that the people don't fully understand it, they revere him as much 
of as somebody of superstitious legend as a person who's powerful, right? And so the result of this is he just kind of realizes I can go forward and actually start conquering things. And so that basically led into his first conflict with Iron Man. Now, in more recent years, underwriter Matt Fraction with Iron Man Annual number one and Iron Man uh, issue number 522, what we actually ended up finding out is a couple different things. The first is that in terms of his traditional origin, it was altered so that he never really knew who his father was and, his, and he was basically born to a English prostitute in an opium den. And so ultimately, he's just kind of forced into a life of child labor. When his mother dies, he kills her pimp. And then in turn, with the Chinese revolution reigning strong, he ultimately ends up escaping to the mountains, the, the Valley of the Spirits, where he discovers the ship of, uh, of Axon Carr. Now, one of the big differences here is that in this particular origin, this newer origin, Axon Carr was actually alive. It wasn't really a skeleton. He was basically dying from his injuries, but he was alive. And he ultimately pleaded with the Mandarin to help him. And then the Mandarin realized that the ship was powered by what passes basically being rings, took the rings for himself, killed Axon Carr, and then went back and started conquering local villages. Now, during this time, he also started studying the power of the 10 rings and learning what each individual ring was capable of, what each of these rings could do. And if you guys are curious about the rings themselves, I've actually got a video over at Geek Culture Explained that kind of runs over them. But the important thing here is that once he mastered what these rings were capable of, which really gave him a variety of abilities, a couple things happened. The first is that he actually started subjugating local villages around him and even kind of christened a, a bit of a location for himself, kind of a base of operations. And the second thing was that the rings themselves were actually imbued with long dead spirits that were always trying to find a way to resurrect themselves by using the Mandarin to do so. So it was largely kind of a subplot and it was one of the things that was used to sort of explain why it is the Mandarin was always looking to attain extreme levels of power because it wasn't necessarily his will. He was being bent to the will of the spirits within the rings. But one of the big questions that fans had at this time is what do we do about the original origin? <laughs> if the original, if this is kind of the new origin that's there, how do we reconcile this with the previous one? And so what Matt Fraction did is, and specifically he did this in Invincible Iron Man Annual Number 1, is he established this idea that because of his history regarding the Mandarin himself, that he wanted his story to have more grandiosity. And a lot of that was predicated on the history of the Mandarin in the sense that he was very much a narcissist and wanted to be seen in the best possible light. And so Matt Fraction essentially established that these origins that had appeared over the years, specifically his original origin, was basically manufactured by the Mandarin, that it wasn't actually his origin. His real origin was the one that Matt Fraction established, that he was born to a hooker in an opium den, and that the whole story of him being a descendant of Genghis Khan and so on and so forth, that he basically just made that up for the purpose of making himself seem more important than he actually was. But regardless, going back to his original appearances in Marvel Comics, one of the funny things that was done here is that in order to make the Mandarin compelling and in order to make him interesting, what had happened is Stan Lee and Don Heck had actually wrapped his story into the original origin of Tony Stark. And the idea, and this is one of the big differences between the comics and the, the film, in the film, the whole idea behind the Ten Rings and all that kind of stuff is it was basically a modern day depiction of wartime, right? So that's why you saw Tony Stark becoming Iron Man in the Middle East, as opposed to in Vietnam, like it was originally in the comics. But in the comic books, the warlord that had basically captured Tony Stark forced him to originally build weapons, which led to Tony Stark and, uh, and Ho Yensen building like what was in effect the Mark I Iron Man suit. That was a guy named Wong Chu. And what you end up learning here is that the Mandarin was essentially behind it all, that he was operating behind the scenes and nobody knew what was happening. That in fact, because of the fact that Tony Stark was so well known as a weapons manufacturer and because the Mandarin was looking to expand his sphere of influence by basically kidnapping Tony Stark, forcing him to build weapons and then using those weapons to essentially conquer even more area around him, kind of expanding his influence in the uh, in that region of the world. This led to him working alongside Wong Chu and then having Tony Stark brought to Vietnam, captured and then forced to build weapons. Of course, as we know, it led to Tony Stark basically escaping and then becoming Iron Man. And so the first real confrontation that you actually saw between the Mandarin and Iron Man himself doesn't really take place until the Mandarin's real first appearance in the Tales of Suspense comics. Now, the way this played out is that because of the fact that the Mandarin presented a credible threat to the Western world due to his desire to basically conquer the world and the fact that he was pretty powerful in his own right, this led to the CIA bringing in Iron Man, who at the time was believed to be the bodyguard of Tony Stark, and then ultimately he was airdropped into the Mandarin's castle. Now, a fight kind of ensued where Tony Stark worked his way up, so it was very similar to like the Game of Death. Any of you guys ever saw that movie with Bruce Lee back in the day where he kind of works his way up to the top of the castle? It's very similar to that. And ultimately, there's attempts made by the Mandarin's forces to study Tony Stark's armor to actually reverse engineer it while Tony Stark was temporarily unconscious. Of course, it doesn't really work. But during the final battle between the Mandarin and Stark, Stark realizes the Mandarin had basically tampered with his suit in order to trick Tony 
Tony Stark into believing the Mandarin was more powerful than he was. But ultimately, Tony Stark realizes what's going on, and then he manages to overcome the Mandarin and then basically flee away from his castle. But the way this ended was that the Mandarin was just kind of studying Iron Man, right? Studying the nature of Iron Man's abilities, what he was capable of, and then trying to find a way to potentially duplicate or look for some future opportunity to reverse engineer that kind of technology and then basically find a way to, uh, to defeat Iron Man and then, of course, expand his influence throughout the rest of the world. But when it came to the Mandarin, this is one of the big differences between a lot of the characters that we'd seen Iron Man face off against over the years and the Mandarin. When it came to people like Justin Hammer, who was essentially a, uh, you know, a corporate enemy and a guy who initiated the armor wars by having Tony Stark's armor stolen and then reverse engineering it, duplicating it, and then selling it off to other villains, looking at people like, uh, like Titanium Man, you know, when it came to these various forces, they were, by all standards of measurements, some variant of Tony Stark, some kind of duplicate of Tony Stark. Even with guys like the Living Laser, people along those lines, they weren't really major or significant threats. I mean, they were intriguing, but when you look at them for what they really were, they really always kind of felt like villains of the week. When it came to somebody like the Mandarin, he was almost every bit as intelligent as Tony Stark was. Not really on the exact same level, but he was highly capable. With his knowledge and his understanding, having spent most of his life studying sciences, engineering, different things like that, he was one of the most mentally challenging villains that Tony Stark faced. And it's one of the things that kept him wildly interesting, both among writers as well as comic book fans, because the question was, if anybody's capable of taking out Tony Stark, will it be the Mandarin? And the answer was consistently, yeah. The Mandarin's the only one who really seems to have the ability to actually overcome Tony Stark. And so over the course of these early issues, this really display of what the Mandarin was capable of came in a bunch of different forms. One of the first things that happened, or at least one of the big things that happened, came in Tales of Suspense as part of a three-part story in issues 84, 85, and 86, where he actually kidnaps Happy Hogan, who's wearing the Iron Man armor, believing Happy Hogan is actually Tony Stark. And that ultimately, Tony Stark manages to rescue Happy and basically blows up the Mandarin's castle. Uh, following that, you end up learning that the Mandarin actually has an orbiting satellite that literally just sits above Earth. He fought out of that as a base of operations for a while. In Avengers Annual, issue number one, he actually ends up bringing together the Living Laser, the original Power Man, Luke Cage, Swordsman, Enchantress, Executioner, brings them together as a singular team to face off against the Avengers and is ultimately defeated. Uh, in Incredible Hulk, issue number 107, he team or he tries to bring in the Hulk to basically defeat Iron Man. I mean, there's a bunch of different instances here where Marvel literally just circled this guy around as fast as they possibly could. There was even a point in uh, in Captain America number 125 when you actually saw the Mandarin fight Captain America in Vietnam. Now, one of the things that Mandarin had also learned of was that Tony Stark was Iron Man, as opposed to the, to the general public's belief that Tony Stark and Iron Man were two completely different people, and Iron Man was a bodyguard for Tony Stark. This is one of the reasons that led to, to the Mandarin actually targeting specific people that Tony Stark knew in his personal life, and trying to use those as a means to have these guys fight each other. Now, one of the things that was particularly interesting here is that in Iron Man issue number 241, really a story arc that spanned quite a while, running all the way up and even involving Uncanny X-Men number 258. Uh, of course, a lot of this was written by David Michelini and, and Bob Layton, as well as uh, Chris Claremont. But one of the big things that you actually end up seeing is the Mandarin working alongside the Hand. Now, this worked because the Hand wasn't really introduced until 1981 uh, during the Daredevil run by Frank Miller. And of course, this comic and story arc was presented about eight years later in 1989. And the Hand had gained a lot of popularity in Marvel Comics because of the work that Frank Miller had done. For those of you guys who don't know what that is, the Hand is a mystical ninja organization that was originally founded by Kaganobu Yoshioka in uh, Japan, really in feudal Japan, and was really just uh, at least initially started as a kind of coming together of a lot of peasants who had taken to the mountains to basically study martial arts when it had been banned by the Japanese government at the time. And so what this led to was the Hand basically making a kind of pact with what was called the Great Beast, which basically gave them mystical abilities. And so ninjas of the Hand or members of the Hand, when they die, they can be resurrected, right? So the Hand is basically a limitless army. And it's one of these things where the Hand usually uses attrition in order to win, right? So if the Hand wants to take somebody out, they'll just send in overwhelming force. And so again, they're a pretty deadly organization, but one of the things that made this so intriguing was not so much that the Mandarin was working with the Hand, it was the fact that he was actually lending his rings to members of the Hand, which made them even deadlier. And it was crazy because you saw all kinds of stuff getting involved here, right? I mean, ultimately Iron Man ended up overcoming them all, right? Because, you know, an Iron Man comic, <laughs> an Iron Man story. But it's one of these things where you actually ended up seeing uh, at least an uncanny X-Men issue number uh, 258, that you actually saw the events of the Siege Perilous playing out. Now, for those of you guys who don't know what that is, the Siege Perilous was an artifact that was given to the X-Men by 
Roma, who was basically the founder, or at least one of the co-founders, like the Captain Britain Corps, things like that. But during this time when Psylocke, Betsy Braddock, uh, when she had basically been believed to have been killed alongside a bunch of the other X-Men, they ended up passing through the Siege Perilous, which would in effect allow them to quote unquote, start new lives all over again. This basically led to Betsy Braddock just washing up on the shores in, in Asia, and then in turn, having her mind swapped with uh, with Quanon. And then basically that led to the Japanese version of Psylocke that most all of you guys have probably seen in your journeys across looking up comic book characters and different things like that. The Mandarin had a hand in that. Looking at all these different events that had taken place over the course of, of Marvel's publication history, the Mandarin had a huge role in a lot of different events because it wasn't just necessarily targeting Tony Stark. It was also doing things like expanding his sphere of influence into businesses, into governments, corrupting individuals, using his power to blackmail individuals, different things like that. There was a lot of stuff happening with him. Now, a lot of the stuff with the Mandarin came to a head with the Heart of Darkness storyline in Iron Man issue number 312 by Lynn Kaminsky. And the reality is a lot of this had to do with Force Works. Now, for those of you guys who don't know what Force Works is, it was basically the result of Avengers West Coast after it was disbanded. And so instead of having a West Coast Avengers team, Iron Man basically rebranded it into his own real superhero team called Force Works, which was pretty popular when it first came out. It was pretty interesting. But the important thing here is that there was a, a kind of artifact called the Heart of Darkness, which was basically an orb that was composed of energy. And the desire by the Mandarin was to basically use this orb to expand his power and influence. Ultimately, Tony Stark was able to overcome this by basically turning the Mandarin into something akin to a cyborg by infecting him with a virus that was one part uh, technology and one part organic. We call it the techno-organic virus. But because of the fact that the orb required a host that was completely biological, it rejected the Mandarin. And then when he was believed to have been dead, it basically just kind of re you know, basically wiped his mind of his memories. And he was like a custodian at Stark Enterprises, right? Now, that was supposed to be the end of the Mandarin. One of the things people don't know is that was supposed to be the original ending of the Mandarin. That was it. This being that was starkly opposed to everything that Tony Stark had stood for uh, ended up becoming basically an employee of Stark himself. And he was to be written out completely. Ultimately, this changed though. When Marvel launched something called Heroes Reborn and Heroes Return, which was Marvel's attempt to basically do a reboot and rework everybody except for uh, X-Men and Spider-Man by literally putting those guys in an alternate reality, there was okay. They tried to rework the Mandarin. It really wasn't all that great. Didn't really do much to make it work. And so the Mandarin was just kind of a character that quite literally just sort of floated around in Marvel Comics for about a decade and a half. He did a few things here and there and some stuff happened, but none of it was of any real note. Instead, it's not until you get to Invincible Iron Man Volume 2 and issue number 33, written by Matt Fraction, that you actually end up seeing the Mandarin becoming probably one of the cooler characters that Marvel's had for quite some time. And a lot of this kicked off with a story called The Long Way Down, which actually actually saw the Mandarin freeing Ezekiel Stane, the son of Obadiah Stane, who had long since been an enemy of Tony Stark. Now this had all happened in 2011, right? So about two years before Iron Man 3. And so as we know, when it comes to movies, movies are usually planned out or the initial phases are usually put together about three years before you start like the production process and casting and all that kind of good stuff. And so if I'm a betting man, I would say that even if Marvel wasn't hell bent on having the concept of the Mandarin being a part of Iron Man 3, it would certainly a talking point. I mean, I could be entirely wrong and it's just, it would have made a cool story. And it did. It made a pretty interesting story here. And the reason why is that for those of you guys who were unfamiliar with Matt Fraction, as opposed to a lot of comic book writers who write their stories like six, maybe seven issues at a time, Matt Fraction would write his stories 12 issues at a time. So technically it would be split into like a six issue story arc, but that story arc is part of a much, much, much bigger story arc. And it all kind of comes together at the end. And what you end up learning here is that when the Mandarin freed Ezekiel Stane, he had also kind of subjugated him to a degree. And that the two of them working together basically saw them repurposing and reworking a lot of Tony Stark's enemies who were out there, right? Blizzard, the Dreadnoughts, Living Laser, the whole nine yards. And these were all villains that over the years had kind of been goofy and silly and not really villains that you took seriously. But because of the enhancements that were given to them between Ezekiel Stain and the Mandarin, they became a lot more dangerous. And so it was really just reorganizing Stark's villains and then having them launch a series of attacks. At the same time, it was also a publicity attack in the sense that the Mandarin had basically used a photo of Iron Man to make him look drunk. And then in turn, because of the fact that the concern was that Tony Stark had gone back to the days of alcoholism, that the US government forced him to build an automatic shutoff or a remote shutoff for the suit, which was used by the Mandarin and Ezekiel Stane. And then ultimately Tony Stark quote unquote died. And this led to James Rhodes basically becoming the new Iron Man. Now, a lot of this was just a great big, huge ruse that Tony Stark had pulled against the Mandarin, tricking the Mandarin into believing Tony Stark had died. Uh, in turn having like James Rhodes become the new Iron Man secretly, all that kind of stuff. Eventually the ruse was discovered by the man
Mandarin. And what you ended up finding out is that this whole entire set of events as it was orchestrated by the Mandarin was not done explicitly for killing Tony Stark. Instead, it was done for building something called Titanomechs, which are basically what you think, these gigantic suits that were actually gonna serve the purpose of allowing the spirits of these warriors in these rings that have been controlling the Mandarin to basically occupy these suits and then, you know, initiate their own campaigns, whatever it is that they happen to be. Now, initially this was somewhat ended, it was somewhat defeated, but then uh, the Mandarin got his hands on Tony Stark and then forced Tony Stark after basically brainwashing him, taking over his mind to finish these Titanomech suits. And so ultimately Tony Stark ends up breaking free of this mind control along with Ezekiel Stane. And then Tony Stark and Ezekiel Stane actually gather together all the villains that Tony Stark's historically fought. And then they all take out the Mandarin, which was cool. It was a really, really great story. It was, it was amazing in terms of how it had all been done. And in fact, the Mandarin himself was basically killed by Ezekiel Stane in Invincible Iron Man number 526. Now, following that, what actually ended up happening during World War Frank, uh, which was part of Punisher volume 12 by uh, Matthew Rosenberg, you actually saw the Mandarin come back. But in reality, not a whole lot's really happened here. That story was written in 2018, and we don't really know if the Mandarin's gonna have any other significant roles in Marvel Comics, at least not that I'm aware of, right? I'm not aware of the Mandarin having returned. If he has, well, then I guess I need to get caught up. <laughs> it is difficult to keep up on all Marvel Comics everywhere all the time. It is tough to do. But regardless, the Mandarin has historically been a highly capable foe of Iron Man. And that's what really differentiated him from a lot of people. And it's one of the things that potentially would make him so cool in the MCU. And this guy's got his hands in everything. If it's a criminal element in the world, he's involved with it in one way or another. Whether it's to expand his sphere of influence or to find a way to kill Iron Man, it all basically amounts to the same thing. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.